Hey, dickheads! I got pink laser beam of truth coming straight from San Diego, California to your brain hole. We have a very special guest on the episode tonight, Lisa Yazik, who is a professor teaching science fiction at the University of Georgia Tech. She's the editor of such books as The Future is Female from the New American Library Collection and Sisters of Tomorrow. She also wrote a book about female science fiction writers called Galactic Suburbia. You may have seen her before in James Cameron's History of Science Fiction. When you get done, look up Lisa's books and uh, please support them. So, and hey, we've got a Patreon too, so support our Patreon. Yeah, so enjoy the interview. Joining us on the Dickheads podcast tonight, uh, Lisa Yazik, right? Is that's pronounced yeah. Yazik? Um, yeah. From uh, Georgia Tech University, and you're a professor and an academic scholar who studies science fiction. Can you give us an introduction of how you got into the genre, and uh, and then we'll get to like how you became a professional? Sure. Yeah. So. Actually, like one of my very first, I've always been a science fiction person. One of my very first memories in the world, and maybe even my first memory when I think about it, was watching Star Trek reruns with my parents from the original series and uh, actually eating uh, carrots out of our organic garden. So obviously I was either going to grow up and do something with organic farming or science fiction. And I'm actually personally happy it turned out with the science fiction because I can buy organic produce from other farmers. So uh, yeah, I've always done science fiction. It's, it's, it's been around me my whole life. I remember finding uh, Joanna Russ and Sam Delaney and Harlan Ellison on my parents' bookshelves when I was about 11, which is a kind of crazy time to find all of those authors, actually. So your and, parents were, yeah. were into it, too. They were. They were. And in fact, when, uh, when we went to college, my best friend and I went to colleges in different states. And then we decided the ways we were going to stay in touch with each other would be we were going to both learn about beer together and we were going to do science fiction together. And we would send each other books. And here we are like decades later and we still do beer and science fiction together. And so, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So yeah. how did you figure out a, a way to make a career as an academic in this field? Like... I didn't even know there was anybody studying science fiction before I heard your interview on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. Well, so it turns out, just so you know, there are uh, probably hundreds, if not thousands of us who do science fiction. We research it, we write it, we create it across media, and we do this often in university environments. But most of us have to pass as something else. So we have to pretend we're English professors or uh, history professors or physics professors. But Georgia Tech has had a really long-standing commitment to science fiction studies, so they've really been um, supportive of me really pursuing that from the beginning. So are it you, was great. Yeah. Are, I, um, are you I, a part I, of the English department? or, or No, or? we're literature, media, and communication. So we do all the humanities across media, and we're specifically, you know, we're at a technical institute, so we're really interested in thinking about humanist perspectives in a technological world and, and how the humanities can help us better understand science and technology and how science and technology change the humanities too. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I was kind of interested in how it fit into uh, Georgia Tech of all places. Where, right. where did you go to for your education? Yeah. Um, so I didn't really, I have a very class, I'm very classically trained. So I did my undergraduate work at University of Michigan where I just got a straight up English degree. Um, although, you know what, even there, I actually did an experimental program for two years that combined the sciences and technology with the humanities. So when I think about it, it's actually something that's always really kind of turned me on. And then I did my graduate work at the University of Wisconsin. And that's where I started oh, yeah. thinking about really that relationship between literature and technology. And so I decided to do my dissertation work on that. And it became a really fun way to start doing science fiction again. But at that point, I was a postmodern literary and cultural scholar. I used all the big 25-cent words, and my books and my thoughts were really deep. Um, so I got all that training, and that was great. And then I got a postdoc at Georgia Tech afterwards, and it was really exciting. And I was like, wow, there are people there who actually study science fiction professionally. There were two people who were doing science fiction at Tech. 
And I was excited to go see what that was about. But the year I got there, they both left. One of them retired and the other took a job elsewhere. So in some ways, of course, that was really sad because I never got to work with them at tech. But it was also very exciting because that meant their jobs opened up. And then when I applied for them, I got one of those jobs the next year. Well, and I think you, you, you mentioned that you uh, did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin. I imagine yeah. that would be really important for uh, your development uh, in this field because uh, Madison, Wisconsin is, was the home for WizCon for all those years. Uh, maybe you why? can tell our listeners what WizCon is sure. and right. why it was so, so important for you. Sure. So WISCON is the largest and oldest feminist science fiction convention in the world. It was started in the 1970s uh, with the rise of feminist science fiction and the revival of feminism across the United States and the world, of course. And it was really cool. I literally lived half a block away from the hotel where they would hold WISCON. So it was so easy to just get up in the morning and go over there. It was wonderful. And uh, actually, I had friends who were involved with WISCON, and then they got me involved in the academic programming, and I had an opportunity to get to start testing my ideas against science fiction authors there, and that was really, that was exciting, it was exhilarating, and it really made it clear to me that this was something I wanted to do with my my, my career. Yeah, Wiz, WISCON is definitely well-known and, and, and famous. Yeah. I've watched lots of videos that have surfaced from years past from WISCON, so... Mm -hmm. Um, oh my god! It sounds like a great time. Um, it's cool. I remember like um, meeting Nalo Hopkinson there before she was Nalo Hopkinson. So when she was just an up and coming writer, and that was cool. And I remember having a really long conversation with her about um, writing in Creole versus writing in English, and which was the easiest way to write science fiction. It was all very exciting, and it's so amazing. Like people I met there, like gosh, twenty years ago now, and it's cool to see how many of these people have really come up and helped shape science fiction as it's currently practiced. And probably seen a lot of those names in uh, award nominations and uh, on spines of your of books too that yeah. who were just getting started then too. So that, that is really cool. Um, it was. Yeah, it was funny too because, you know, my, both my parents are science fiction fans. And so actually the horrible thing when I was doing WISCON, I also was involved sometimes with the Tip Tree Awards and Every year, my parents would be such nudges. They're like, who's going to win? Who should we be reading? What should we be reading? What are you going to send us? So um, <laughs> both wonderful and horrible all at once. Now, I, I think I missed, uh, uh, where did you grow up, um, actually? Um, sorry. Yep, I grew up outside Detroit. Outside so Detroit. It, so you're yep, in Michigan. Detroit suburbs. So again, another very sort of science fictional part of my, oh, my whole youth was very science fictional, like spending time in Detroit in the 1980s, it, it really was kind of a lot like RoboCop, actually, you know, people are like, oh, was it like RoboCop? And I'm like, yes, and we have a statue of RoboCop in Detroit, <laughs> so. Well, that's funny, I, was, I yeah. literally just finished a novel about Detroit. Um, no kidding. Two hours ago, uh, Broken oh. Monsters by uh, Laura Bukes. Um, have, I don't oh, know if, wow. Yeah. It, it's um, it's weird because she's from South Africa, but yes. it feels like she really knows Detroit. <laughs> um, well, right. I mean, both Detroit and South Africa are places in the world that have had some kind of intense issues with black-white relations. So, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that's it. And also, Detroit's so kind of part of the science fictional imagination, right? It's so cyberpunky, and it's such one of these, like, industrial cities in decay that people keep trying to reboot with varied success and mm -hmm. it, it it really was like that growing up in fact i remember uh, again i mentioned that my best friend and i would send each other science fiction books when we were in college and i remember he sent me burning chrome uh you know gibson's collection at first collection of short stories and he's like oh dude this is exactly like being in detroit and running around the renaissance center and i'm like it is it is <laughs> so yeah. well yeah my experience with detroit i i uh grew up a punk rock hardcore and hardcore yeah. kid in, in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. So we used to yeah. have friends in Detroit. We'd go up to shows in mm -hmm. Detroit from time to time. And yeah. um, it was, yeah, it was a crazy city in the late eighties or <laughs> early nineties. It and, was, it was, it was, I was on a loop with like, I knew like I was more on the industrial loop, I think at that point, but mm -hmm. uh, similar sort of thing. But we had, I think it was the Detroit Ann Arbor Toledo connection. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that was um yeah, a, a cool uh town to visit. So, uh definitely see where that could have a an, an influence. So Fantastic town to visit, but you don't need to live there. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
So now that you're at Georgia Tech, um, mm -hmm. your, one of your passions, I know, is to find lost or forgotten voices. Can you explain yeah. how you got interested in that and why it's so important to, uh, to find these voices and where do you right. find them? Right. So I actually got interested in some ways, in some very practical ways. I was putting together my first science fiction courses at Georgia Tech. And one thing I knew was that I definitely wanted to teach the greats, the people we all know, but I also wanted to include some other voices just to give the students a sense of the diversity of science fiction. You know, I know that in, I knew that in the contemporary moment, there were so many different voices out there and I was sure that there had to be, you know, Clark and Asimov and Heinlein are wonderful and I wanted to make sure I taught them, but I also wanted to put some of the other voices in. And we have a really big science fiction collection at Georgia Tech. We're actually one of the top 20 research collections in the world. And so I decided, I'm like, well, I'm going to go in the collection and find some stuff to read. And I went back and I was looking at original anthologies. And in particular, I was looking at a lot of um, the year's best of science fiction and fa of a magazine of science fiction and fantasy. Um, and so I was shocked when I was looking through these. There were all these names of all these women that I had never heard of. And, a few, you know, there were a few women I had heard of, like Judith Merrill and Carol M. Schwiller, people who had gone on and continued to be popular authors in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and aughts. But there were just so many other names I hadn't seen. I'm like, who is Mildred Klingerman? And who is Alice Eleanor Jones? And who is this person? And who is that person? And I would read the editorial introductions to them, and it was so clear that they were so well-known and well-loved at the time. And then I thought, where did all these people go? Like, what happened to these women? And that's really what got me started on that. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, that par partners really easily with, I'm going to come out and say the F word. I'm a feminist. I'm interested in feminist things. And, you know, one of the mandates of feminism is to recover women's voices and all their diversity. And so you bring that together with sort of science fiction geekiness and, an archive full of people you've never seen before, or women you've never read, and, and the rest was history from there. Yeah, and, and um, finding these lost voices, I think, is, is a really fun aspect of, of what we're doing, too, even though we're, we are, as a podcast, devoted to one of the greats with Philip K. Dick, right. and one of the most well-known, but we're trying to find ways to, for example... Um, we, you know, we just interviewed Barry Maltzberg and yeah. we're definitely wanting to get his name out there. Uh, one right. of the reasons we're doing this interview right. is all the lost voices, but we found right. a connection with, I was randomly reading this essay where Philip K. Dick mentioned, um, uh, a short story that he said was his biggest influence when he was a kid. And it was a story called Alas All Thinking, uh, by Harry Bates, who, um, I had never heard of. And, right. And so we went down this rabbit hole and we did a whole episode about this short story because it was from the 30s. And I was like, yeah. whoa, young Phil, Philly K. Dick was influenced by this. And I wanted to know, right? Right. And then I found yeah. out that he wrote the story that The Day the Earth Stood Still was based off of. And then I was like, I, I, I've never heard of this guy. And it was really cool to, to find this lost voice. And yeah. And we'll talk more about the individual um, authors that, that you mm -hmm. found for the uh, Futures Female in, in a bit. But mm -hmm. I think that it's got to be one of the coolest feelings when you find one of these stories that is, like, for example, oh. ahead of its time. You oh, know? my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I've had that experience. It's been really exciting. I, I remember when I first started doing this work about 10 years ago, and I was talking with Gordon Van Gelder, the current um, owner and publisher of magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And I remember he was saying we were trying to track down copyright and, and the families of some of these authors. And he's like, well, you know, I've got all of Anthony Boucher's notes, but they're illegible. So we're going to do our Tony. best here. And, and then, you know, if any families come out, we'll just hope that they're really excited to see like great Aunt Mildred's books republished. And the amazing thing is that's exactly the experience we've had. Like families have come out. We've found families since then. Like people will reach out to, you know, either um, Gordon or my editors at Library of America or even occasionally myself. And it's so exciting to meet like these, like the great grand nephews and grand nieces of these people. And they're like, they're so excited to see their, their family members back in print. And, they're so helpful. They're like, can we give you like this box of photos or this trunk of unpublished manuscripts? It's really been so exciting. Whoa. I even found out at, at one point when I was doing this that 
um, a really good friend of mine, his mom had been writing these stories and, and I had no idea. And I was like, did you know your mom was a well-known science fiction author? And he's like, well, I remember she used to write science fiction stories. I didn't know anything happened with them. And he's a well-known comic book author. So this was kind of amazing to me. I'm like, oh, it runs in your family, it turns out. <laughs> so it's, That, it's that must be cool. an amazing it's revelation cool. for yeah. a child to learn that their parent was, was a science fiction writer and they didn't even yeah. know it. I mean, yeah. he knew, but he hadn't thought anything about it because he apparently what his mom would do is she was a middle school teacher and she would teach a creative writing class. And every time she taught a creative writing class, she would write a story and then she would go publish it. But mm. he always had known about it as a kid from the teacher perspective. He didn't really think about the fact that it had been published. So he was like, yeah, let me read my mom's stuff. So that's been really cool, you know? Yeah. Um, my favorite one is uh, there's an author named Alice Eleanor Jones who writes the most horrifying dystopic post-war stories in the universe they're just marvelous and um she only did five science fiction stories before she left for the greener pastures of slick si of the slick magazines but um we've been republishing her and my editors at library in america have been in touch with her i think it's a great grandnephew and he's been so excited about all this and then recently i was approached by a, a hollywood director who had read some of my stuff and then got interested in Alice Eleanor Jones. And he's like, I want to build a movie or a mini series based on her really horrible vision of the world. And I'm like, yeah, that would probably do really well. So it's <laughs> exciting to see other people get excited about this. And I hope that we don't lose these women again, that we get to keep them in the public imaginary this time. Oh, that that's awesome. Because as, as you said, with the feminist idea of recovering voices, it, it it's gotta be the best feeling to, to to uh oh, to see these these authors yeah. get rediscovered yeah yeah it's very yeah. cool on that note another uh um kind of subgenre of science fiction you've been working with is um i i know that you've been involved in an upcoming book on afrofuturism um, right yes can let, let's talk cuz sure. this is something that i'm i did a at last two years i tried to get more into afrofuturism i did i read a lot of the big names like Nadia mm. Okafor and I've mm. read Octavia Butler for years and of course. And, um, but, uh, you know, trying to get a little deeper into that and, um, shout out to, uh, my fellow Hoosier Maurice brought us who just yeah. signed a big deal for a, um, for a trilogy of, um, of space opera of Afrofuturistic space opera for tour. So, um, so big shout out to my homie, uh, Maurice brought yeah. us. And, uh, but yeah, tell me about your involvement in, uh, in yeah. this book and what, what we can sure. look forward to. Right. So I've actually been doing, if you believe Wikipedia, I've been doing Afrofuturism for a long time and I'm actually one of the world's leading experts on it. But again, you got to believe Wikipedia on that. So <laughs> I'll leave that up to all of you to decide. But, um, yeah, I'm so interested in, um, again, minority voices, different voices in science fiction, and I include scientists in that, by the way, too, just so you know. Right. But, yeah, I've done a lot of work on race and science fiction, and, again, this began back when I was in graduate school. It had actually began with my work on Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which most people don't consider science fiction, but a highbrow, canonical piece of American, great American literature. But if you read the 25th anniversary or 35th anniversary edition, I can't remember which it is, the first thing Ellison says in his introduction is, the last thing I set out to do was to write a science fiction novel, which of course means he wrote a science fiction novel, right? right. So I really started poking at that and thinking about it. And I'm like, huh, you know, this is a science fiction novel. And then that just got me interested in general in the ways that both mainstream and genre authors of color uh, use science fiction to imagine futures in full color and to really ask us to rethink the way we think about science, technology, and race. So that's been really exciting work that I've been doing for a while now. And then I'm working with my uh, colleague and friend, Isaiah Lavender III, who was recently at Louisiana State and is now going to be at Georgia State University, so closer to me, which is fun. And we've got actually two Afrofuturist projects coming out. So we've got a book on Afrofuturist criticism where we're looking at the different ways that scholars have approached Afrofuturism. But what's really exciting about that book is we also have an author roundtable and we got some marvelous authors to come in and talk with us about how they feel about Afrofuturism as a label for black speculative fiction. And of course, you know, authors, they all, they hate labels. So that was really a lot of fun. 
And then we've got another project we're doing called Beyond Afrofuturism, where we're trying to look at what else is out there besides this particular kind of future forward black speculative fiction. What else do black speculative authors do? What else do other authors of color do? What are people like black people in South Africa doing, for instance? So it's been really exciting for us to explore that. And I look forward to hearing how people react to it. Yeah, um, I just realized I skipped over one of my questions and I got this far and I haven't asked you about the man himself, uh, Philip K. Sure. Dick. Um, of course. What's your experience with Philip K. Dick and, and uh, you know, do you have anybody who focuses on his work right. in the academic community there? Right. So um, with that, at Georgia Tech in particular, we don't have anyone who specifically focuses on Dick, but um, a lot of us have worked with Philip K. Dick all the time in, in our classes and in our research. So um, I certainly think about the ways that he moves science fiction forward in terms of thinking about different kinds of realities, um, about extrapolating from some of the exciting and not exciting things that are happening in the 60s and 70s, drug culture, all these other things. And I was really lucky. I actually got to talk about Philip K. Dick when I was on James Cameron's story of science fiction for American movie classics. So mm -hmm. I get to talk about him a little bit. I have colleagues in film who get to talk about adaptation, right? Because Philip K. Dick is probably the most adapted science fiction author out there, I think, maybe even more than H.G. Wells, which is mm -hmm. amazing if you think about it. So we've got people, and of course there are people who specialize in thinking about Philip K. Dick and, and that kind of really dreamy new wave science fiction and mm -hmm. um so yeah there are people out there who are doing that yeah there's few people who talk about him quite as much as we do but right. uh, <laughs> but we do we do have um the, i mean i think uh he is such a rich tapestry to yes. to delve into and yeah. and i think um you know definitely he revolutionized science fiction but of course yeah. You know, when we look down the list of names of uh, authors that are, are in your book, we see just as revolutionary of voices and in, in um, writers like Ursula Le Guin, Lee Brackett, and certainly for feminist voices, I would put um, Octavia Butler in there too. Yes. And, yeah, I know we couldn't get her in the book because she hadn't published by the 1970 cutoff. It was so frustrating <laughs> right um but you know what what we're hoping for is the sequel so everyone go out and buy the future is female am i allowed to say that on your show oh yeah absolutely okay well, buy we're the gonna... book, so uh, library of america will be encouraged to do part two because i mean that was one of the really tricky things about the future is female we have all these wonderful revolutionary women um who much like philip k dick uh were were really reinventing the genre and but but we don't have any women of color in there because women of color were just not publishing as far as we know in the pulp magazines. We know there were a few women of Native American heritage who were working in the very early pulps, but then, you know, and it's, it's possible since so much of that work was done by mail that there were indeed black authors, but we, I have not recovered them yet, which is really interesting. Well, and, and, and first, I mean, I read uh, Samuel Delaney for years before I knew yeah. that he was a person of color or and a lot of people and queer experience. and yeah. you know a lot of like cool things that just people didn't know that you know back right. then right right well right. so let's and, talk let's talk before we get to we're gonna get heavily into the future as female in a little bit okay. but before you did that you you this was not your first book highlighting women in the genre um can you tell us about sisters of tomorrow and what that book's like Right. So my book, right before the future of female, it's called the sisters of, it's called sisters of tomorrow, the first women of science fiction. And that's literally what that book is. We were looking at how women helped build science fiction as a popular genre in the American magazine community, uh, from the 1920s to about the 1940s. So really that first one or maybe two generations of, of women. So the people who were there before the golden age, before science fiction really became central to the public imagination. Um, and what we really, what we found was that women have been there since the beginning. Um, you know, it wasn't just like Mary Shelley wrote a book in 1818 and then all of a sudden Ursula Le Guin and Joanna Rush showed up in 1970. There were lots of women in between then. Um, and from the very beginning, um, about 15% of the contributors to the science fiction community were women. And we know from readers' polls that at least 40% of the R readers were women. So there really were a lot of women there. And it's no surprise that 
Hugo Gernsback's early editorials are all about men and boys, but by 1930, he's like, and the girls, and the women. All right. of us, we're all doing this. So that was really wonderful. Well, and John W. Campbell had a, I can't remember oh. her name, his his um, his right-hand woman, the uh, secretary. Kay Tarrant, yes. yes. Kay Tarrant, yes. Right. So right, she was famous. Um, it's so funny, right, because Campbell was really hands-on, and my understanding is he would actually, they kind of flipped roles, right? She was supposed to manage the submissions and do the editing, and she did do, like, she sort of, made sure everything stayed PG rated apparently. Mm -hmm. But Campbell was the one who was really into like nitty gritty editing. And so they would flip around and she would do much more sort of the shaping of ideas and he would actually do the line editing, which I think is funny. Mm -hmm. um, but she was very famous amongst authors for being very strict with uh, content. And that content had to stay very PG if not G rated. And so apparently it was a big joke to try to get in dirty jokes that she wouldn't notice. <laughs> so, but at the same time, she was really, she's what kept the trains running on time. And we find this like throughout the science fiction community that there were women who were both at the helm and behind the scenes who were really running things. So the most fame, uh, the most, uh, not famous, but the most, it was pretty famous, but certainly the most financially uh, solvent magazine of the 1950s was Famous Fantastic Mim uh, Mysteries. And that was run from beginning to end by a woman. So Mm -hmm. I guess the ladies knew how to make bank, if nothing else. Right. And so a lot of these stories are probably in your book, uh, Galactic yeah. Suburbia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we see some of them. I actually do more with the women editors in um, Sisters of Tomorrow, where we had the luxury of not looking at just writers, but looking at artists and poets and editors and even science fiction journalists. So that was a really exciting opportunity. But it is true that in Galactic Suburbia, that's really where I did my first deep dive into all of this work. And that book is different than the two other ones we've talked about, because the other two books are anthologies of stories. And Galactic Suburbia is a much more traditional academic book. It's a real history of science fiction and of women in science fiction uh, from World War II until the revival of feminism. Mm -hmm. And I started there because that was how I had shaped those first classes. That's where I found these women at first was was in the 30s and 40s or the, really the 40s and 50s and 60s anthologies. Um, and then when I had put that book together, my editor at Ohio State said, you know, these stories sound so cool, Lisa, but they're so impossible for anyone to access unless they have a university library nearby. And she's like, you should really do an anthology where you bring these stories back. And then she said, well, my press isn't going to publish that, but some press will do that. And, right. of course, she turned out to be right. I've had several presses that have been really excited about that project. Yeah, um, there, those two books are definitely on my list. I've, I've only read The Future is Female so far. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really important work that you're doing. and, oh, and thanks. Uh, um, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on here. So we got a long way to go here, though. Cool. Um, you... Just all this research into magazines, um, there's one name that uh, he was the first person to ever publish, Philip K. Dick, and mm -hmm. he's behind a lot, a lot of this. And a long-running joke on this show is uh, shout out to Tony, Tony Boucher. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about uh, what you've learned about Tony Boucher? Because he's so important to Philip K. Dick. So important. And, yeah. And, and I'm figuring he's so important to the whole genre and. He's just kind of a name that we've thrown out a lot there, but right. with the um, Barry Maltzberg interview and, and this one, I'd really like to, to delve more yeah. into who Tony Voucher is. Yeah, he was fantastic. Um, and he really was important to shaping science fiction in its modern formulations. We, we tend to think about John W. Campbell as being the godfather of modern science fiction. And it is certainly true that his work at Astounding in the 40s and 50s did indeed set a lot of the standards for good science fiction that we still, I think a lot of us carry with us today. We, I always find on the first day of classes, I ask my students, what is good science fiction? And they always come up with very Campbellian definitions. So mm. that's wonderful. But he wasn't the only game out there. And in fact, Campbell was notoriously hostile to women. So uh, women as who is it who said this? I think it was um, maybe Marion Zimmer Bradley said, fortunately, there was always somewhere else to publish besides with Campbell. Now, he did publish <laughs> some women. He famously published Judith Merrill, and uh, he published her story, That Only a Mother, which really was the gateway drug for women's science fiction in some ways. It set the standard for the way a lot of women wrote for the next 20 years. 
So um, that was great. But he had Boucher to be dared really, into it, didn't he? What? Didn't he have to be was, dared into it? Like, yes, it was. It was a, it was on a drunken bed at Worldcon because he was talking about how women can't write science fiction. Ironic because he was publishing where he started publishing was in magazines that supported women. But we're going to just go with that for a minute. Yeah. So he was like, oh, women can't write science fiction. And Judy Merrill said, I can write science fiction. And not only can I write science fiction, but you're going to love my story so much. You're going to buy it. And then you're going to beg me for more. And that first story she sent him that only a mother he did. He loved it. He bought it and he begged her for more. And, you know, it's a marvelous story. It invents it's the first story that has a character of the housewife heroine, um, sort of this modern technological woman whose happiness or unhappiness reflects how good or bad our culture is at the moment. And he loved the story and he said, this is great. I want more. So she gave him another story and it was a Martian colonization story. And he rejected it immediately. He said, I don't want this. There's no housewives in it. So... You know, he uh, he got his consciousness raised a tiny bit, but then he couldn't get much further than that. But Tony Boucher, he really saw the possibilities inherent in what this new generation of women were doing. He broke a lot of new authors. Obviously, he, as you know, obviously he was working with experimental male authors like Philip K. Dick um, and Ray Bradbury. But he was also really interested in women, and he was one of the big defenders of domestic science fiction or women's science fiction, as I sometimes call it. And he would always talk about how it was really important to have stories told from the sensitive viewpoint of a woman. And mm. in some ways, yeah, that sounds kind of sexist, but in a world where it was either that or no women's voices, it was certainly better than nothing. Well, and he was very supportive of all kinds of women writing often really grim or really, really racy stuff. So if you wanted to say something that was not necessarily going to work well in a mainstream American publication, going into science fiction and especially working with Anthony Boucher at Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction was really the way to go. In fact, I found that Shirley Jackson, um, you know, the famous American horror writer, she used to talk about that a lot, about how whenever she wrote a story that she knew could never be bought by good housekeeping, she would just go right to fantasy and science fiction because she knew that Anthony Boucher would take it in a heartbeat. Shout out to Tony. Because he knew, he knew a head bug when he saw it. <laughs> well, and, and you know, it's funny because when uh, we were interviewing Maltzberg, um, it, I had said, you know, well, you know, he, Tony Boucher and, and Don Wilhelm, they're getting all these like crazy manuscripts, at least we knew from Philip K. Dick, yeah. right? Yeah. And I said, was there ever anything that was just too out there? And Maltzberg, it was funny because he was like, we were we were pretty hip guys. <laughs> and, you know, they were and they weren't. You know, I think maybe the women would tell a slightly different story about that, right? So, right. for instance, like we might think about Ursula K. Le Guin's Nine Lives. Look, so Le Guin sold Nine Lives to Playboy, and for for people who don't know this, when Playboy first started in the late fifties and then through the sixties, um, people really did read it for the science fiction. Like they, they published very cutting edge science fiction. They were publishing people like Philip K. Dick, like Harlan Ellison. And then eventually they bought a story from Le Guin and she was the first female science fiction author that they published. And they were so nervous about her story, which was about clone sex, um, and about having a woman write it. They had her uh, published under a pseudonym. Wow. So. Yeah, so, I, I did not know that she published in Playboy. That's yeah, that's really yeah, odd. yeah. <laughs> but, I know, right? The great things you learn. It's wonderful. She said she used the money to buy herself. I think it was a Volkswagen uh, van. So yeah. it's a good use for it. Yeah, yeah very good use. Um, all right. So uh, now, finally, we're going to get into the future as female, <laughs> um, specifically this book. Um, it, this was. Um, I first uh, discovered this book and heard of your work through hearing you on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, which cool. um, people who follow my blog or follow this podcast know I mention Geek's Guide to the Galaxy all the time. David Barr currently does a great job. And uh, I was immediately excited. I went and ordered the book right away because I wanted to – well, beyond the fact that I wanted to have you on this podcast, I just wanted to know about these women. Um, and – what what percentage of these stories were ones that you knew right from the beginning, this story has to be in there versus the process of researching right. the magazines and looking for them? Yeah. So there were, it wasn't as much stories as authors. I knew that there were authors I wanted to make sure we included right away. And I wanted to make sure we had a mix of authors whom 
at least some science fiction people might know. So people like Judith Merrill, um, or some people will know CL Moore, but we wanted, and certainly Ursula Le Guin, we wanted to have a few names in there that people would know. But we also really wanted to show the diversity of women's voices and how many women were out there and how the people like Le Guin were just the tip of the iceberg. So because I had been doing research on that already for 10 years, I had some ideas about people whom I wanted to include. But it was interesting because working with the Library of America was a very different experience for me in some ways. The Library of America, they do mainstream highbrow literature. They are the nonprofit that basically decides who counts as the American canon and what you're going to read in high school, what your kids will read in high school, and what their great-great-grandchildren will read in high school. And it's very new for them to do science fiction. So they had some very different ideas about what constituted good literature than what I did. And so they had ideas about we want to include this kind of story or like we found this story and we really love it. And sometimes it was heartbreaking because you would have to tell them, well, you love it, but no one else has ever loved that story in the world. <laughs> but at other times, you know, they had some great ideas. And it was an interesting and occasionally really wild process of negotiation with them. And it was cool uh, how eventually just everyone got involved with reading the stories and commenting. And we, we, we managed to find a good balance, I think, between high literary quality, and I'll put that in air quotes, and you can define that as you want, um, and big, exciting ideas and exciting adventures. And I'm pretty pleased with the balance we came up with, but it was definitely a process of research and negotiation, for sure. Well, um, shout out to uh, our, our boy, uh, Evan Lampy, who's a uh, podcaster who does a Philip K. Dick book club online, and we have him on all the time. He is currently doing a, 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 another podcast where he's reading all the uh, Library of America books, all of oh, them. Oh wow! For wow. his podcast, so he uh, did want me, did uh, tweet at me and wanted to mention that um, he is going to get your book this summer, and it's one of the ones cool. that uh, he's most looking forward to. Um, oh, tell him to get in touch. He can email me, and um, you know, we'll, well, I'm happy to help him out any way I can. Sure, and um, uh, he'll be excited about that. Uh, yeah. He's one of, and you know, he and I had this discussion about um, online about these lost authors and, and how important it was. But one of the things that I know you've highlighted because we, he and I talked about this whole stereotype that, that um, women science fiction writers were writing under men's names, but right. But really the reality is that it kind of went both ways, yeah. right? Yeah. More than people realize. Yeah. So right. Two things that are wrong with that story. One is that of course, a few women did this. Um, and there's like one famous example in literally every generation. The problem is, is that famous example has overshadowed the hundreds of other women who were writing under their own names. And yeah. in the early magazine community in particular, it wasn't just that they were writing under their own names. They were getting their pictures published with the magazines. Um, Gernsback and some of the other editors had the staff artists draw pictures of all the authors. And, and they're lovely, lovely drawings. And you know, you had to be really stupid if you didn't see that picture of Leslie Stone and figure out she was a woman. Um, <laughs> but, you know, maybe you missed the picture, and that was fine. If you did, the editors were always very quick to correct these things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, all right, so let's get into so, the individual yeah. stories. Um, and I'm not going to go, since I'm going to highlight the first one, don't right. think that I'm going to do every single one. But <laughs> this uh, Claire Winger Harris story, ah, The Miracle of the Lily miracle from the 1928, Lily. This yeah. one blew me away um, with the advanced, uh, like, scientific thinking that this story had for 1928 yeah. and the vast scope in a short yeah. story that it had. Can you tell yeah. me where you found this story? Because this one blew me away. Right, yeah. So Claire Winger Harris was actually the first woman who published in the science fiction magazines on um, under her own name, and then also she was just the first woman who published in the specialist magazines. So science fiction officially begins as a genre with amazing stories in 1926, and she's in there by 1929, and actually she was publishing in Weird Tales before then as well. So Harris was there from the beginning, and I had found her actually through another scholar who has also, I mean, other women and men besides myself have done work recovering science fiction scholars, and I had um, had I had been reading another scholar who had talked a little bit about Claire Winger Harris, 
And she was actually talking about some different stories that Harris wrote, The Fate of the Poisidonia, um, which is a wonderful story where in the end, all the men from Earth and Mars turn out to be complete idiots and useless. And there's a woman who has to step up and save the day. Very <laughs> funny story. Um, so, but I had found Harris through that reference and then I was pulling her stories and she was very, very prolific. She was really well known, very much celebrated within the community as one of uh, the top science fiction writers of her time. She was one of the first authors of either sex to publish an anthology of her own stories. So good marketing for her. Mm -hmm. And she won one of the very first science fiction awards. So, um, oh, and she also wrote the very first piece of science fiction criticism. She wrote... And uh, a letter to the editors, I think it was amazing, it might have been Wonder Stories, I don't remember, where she lists out all the different kinds of science fiction stories available. And she's one of the first people to start uh, checking off different types of stories. And a lot of them were stories that she basically, like story types, she helped build. Mm. So the environmental story, like The Miracle of the Lily, she's one of the first people to tell that kind of story. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, and this story, uh, the concept that um, the collapse of I mean, it's been a couple months since I read it, but um, yeah. like the collapse of uh, the it, the ecology happens basically yes. because people try to take out ants. Yeah, um, and right, right. Just amazing concept for, especially yeah. for 1928. But I, I would well, think the, that was an amazing concept if it was written in 2019, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So in some ways, of course, it's really timely. And if you go back and look, the first uh, modern pesticides are being introduced into farming and what would eventually become factory farming mm -hmm. at that point in time. So she's very much drawing on something that would have been in the news and people would have been thinking about. And the other really cool thing about Claire Winger Harris is she went to Smith College. And first of all, she went to college and finished college in an era when less than 10% of Americans went to college at all. So that's cool. But also Smith College at that time was, was known for having some of the best science facilities in America um, of any kind of college. So she really had a lot of exposure to science and technology, um, both through her undergraduate training, then through her professional career. And then she married an engineer and she had three boys, all of whom grew up to be engineers. So she was always one way or another, very enmeshed in science and technology. And I think it's so funny that on her census, uh, whenever she filled out census forms, she would say she was just a housewife. And yet she was clearly a housewife and much more as well. Right. Um, so one of the um, more so uh, th this story wasn't as impressive to me as the novel that I eventually read of hers, but C.L. Moore's um, uh -huh. Black God's Kiss. C.L. Moore for me was a big revelation in this book because she's from Indiana. I'm a Hoosier. Uh, yep. grew, and she went to college in my hometown for two years before the Great Depression, uh, you know, ruined mm -hmm. that for her. She had to go home and work. And um, but she wrote a lot of high fantasy novels, but yeah. she had an, she had a major impact on the genre on her own, but also mm -hmm. as a team with her eventual yes. husband. So could you tell the listeners about CL Moore? We talked a little bit about her during the Barry Maltzberg interview too. But. Yeah. So, right. So she's really one of, of the great names of early science fiction, both on her own. And as you said, as uh, in, in terms of writing with her husband, Harry Kuttner, so, but Moore got her start in the early 1930s with a story called Chamblo. It's a horror story, essentially. And it's a wonderful horror story. It's some really amazing, freaky gender stuff in it. I'm just not even going to talk about it. You just must read it. But apparently, when she wrote that story and sent it in, uh, the, the, the mythology around it is that uh, she sent it to Weird Tales, and the guy who was then the editor, Farnsworth Wright, was so excited about it that he closed down Weird Tales in celebration for the day because he knew he had a winner on his hand. And she continued to write really interesting stories. She often writes about the uncanny and about um, humans meeting people who are radically transformed, who are either radically alien to us or uh, been radically transformed by science and technology. So... Uh, and she was very influential in that respect. And she worked primarily, I think, in, in Weird Tales, but she was also working in a science fictional mode as well as a horror mode. And Harry Kuttner actually met her. He wrote her a fan letter. He thought she was a guy because she went by her initials, C.L. Moore. And he was shocked to find out that Mr. Moore was actually Ms. Moore and uh, young and available. And the rest from there was history. And they very quickly fell in love and got married and, and started a writing partnership 
but they did all kinds of things together. They wrote together. They wrote science fiction together. They actually both went back to college together on the GI Bill in the 1940s, and they picked up degrees in screenwriting. They taught at, I think, UC Santa Barbara, and they would sort of change classes back and forth. So they were really, really very closely working together for a very long time. And in fact, after Kuttner died, Moore continued to teach his classes, I know, at, um, at his college level classes and continued to do like some of the television scripts they'd been working on together. So and, and, real powerhouse. They really together shaped early science fiction. And speaking as an Indiana person, she, yeah. she, she comes from um, very close to geographically in the same city as the same neighborhood as Kurt Vonnegut. So, oh, no kidding. A lot of weirdness uh, out, must of, have been. Yeah. out of that part of Indianapolis. Uh, very cool. Um, well, her novel, Doomsday Morning, uh, mm -hmm. I, I read because I discovered her in Features Female, and one of the things that I really liked about that novel was it's uh, deliciously out of date, um, yeah. because it's, um, was written in the fifties and it's like, it's about this traveling, um, theater troupe who are doing propaganda for the government kind of in this post nuclear or kind yes. of dystopic situation. But it's funny because the idea that there would be a theater troupe doing that. I know. I know. It, it, I I, it's so out of date. And I love that because I love I, reading out of date science fiction. Isn't that really great? <laughs> And I got to, I feel like she wrote that right in the 50s. So that's mm -hmm. when she was, by that point, she was no longer writing science fiction. She was almost exclusively in the television industry by then and writing Bonanza. So, right. uh, you know, obviously thinking about theater and acting and drama was probably well on her mind by that point. Um, I like Doomsday Morning and I, I always get, I love science fiction novels about actors because they're always so strange um, and fun. But I got to say, I like the short stories, and I, I do like Jarell of Jory stories, um, so Black God's Kiss, which we included mm -hmm. in The Future is Female, for the simple fact that, you know, it's, it's really easy today to look around and see a lot of, like, strong women in science fiction and fantasy, but they've been there since the beginning, mm -hmm. and, you know, it wasn't like when James Cameron invented Ellen Ripley, or uh, rather Ridley Scott, and when... Uh, George Lucas invented Princess Leia. That stuff doesn't come out of their, out of nowhere. It comes out of their own reading in the history of science fiction. And it seems to me like if you want to know where like Ripley and Leia come, Princess Leia come from, they come from Jarell of Jory. And that's important and mm -hmm. cool. And I like the idea of a heroine who's so full of herself, she totally misses the point of her entire quest. Like that actually feels very modern to me. And I do yeah. think James Cameron deserves more respect for turning Ripley into a hero, but um, yeah. than uh, than Ridley Scott. Or, Gil, or else his wife Gail Hurd does. So you know exactly. we can have that conversation yeah. too. <laughs> um, so another story that I I that particularly hit me in the future is female is the Catherine McLean story Contagion. Yeah, that's a cool story, isn't it? Yeah, um, I love the science as it is from 1950. Um, yeah. and how, uh, it makes, uh, space travel and visiting another planet seem really freaking weird and fucked up. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I super, and as a horror guy, as a sci-fi and a horror guy, it's, it's yeah. a great horror story as well. Yeah, uh, it is, isn't it? I love how in the story, I also love how human the characters are in the story. Not only is it horrifying to see everyone turning into the same person, but I love how as long as, right, because the story is told from the perspective of a woman. Mm -hmm. And I love how as long as it's all the guys who are being turned into the one hot guy on the planet, like they're <laughs> like, oh, this isn't so bad. We're going to have all these really good looking guys around us. But then the minute that the women get changed and they're no longer unique and beautiful and individual, that it becomes a problem. And I think that's so smart because it has a sort of general, I think, sense of, like you're saying, horror that's going to appeal to anyone. But there's also something about the gendering of that story that it's just, to me, delightful. <laughs> yeah. That, that was definitely one of my favorites. And, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, Lee Brackett's story, um, All the Colors of the Rainbow, which basically to me was a Twilight Zone episode. Um, yeah, and isn't that a one-off for Lee Brackett? It just, it's so different than how she usually writes. Exactly. She writes mostly space opera and, <laughs> but you know, she did that with her novel too. The, the Long Tomorrow is, is uh, a post-nuclear oh, novel. And, yes. And to novel. me, one of, her, one of her best and, 
yeah. and and nothing like the majority of her work. So she definitely could no. strike out like that. For people yeah. who don't know, Lee Brackett is most well remembered because she wrote the first draft or the first screenplay for Empire Strikes Back. Um, so basically, um, and she had a big role in creating Yoda, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's well known for that. But she had such an amazing career long before that. I do think it's one of the coolest things that George Lucas did was to yeah. um, to find this woman who was uh, so important to the pulps yeah. and, and make her a part in her. And but that, she did have a big uh, screenwriting career. So let's yeah. be honest about that. Well, she wrote the Maltese Falcon, so mm -hmm. she was well pedigreed by the time Lucas went to her, right? I mean, she yeah. had a huge career in Hollywood. But I think it was cool to connect her to the space opera, and yeah. and, 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 and I think, you know, in her draft of, of Empire Strikes Back is still out there, and yes, Lawrence yeah. Kasdan did a lot uh, before the final thing, but... Her, her draft is great. Um, and, and, is, and he ultimately comes back to it. Like, if you look through the multiple drafts, like, the mm -hmm. final draft they came up with is a lot closer to her original draft than many of the interim drafts were. Mm -hmm. So she There's clearly a lot, was on to something. Yeah, there was a lot more Hoth um, yeah. in her draft. But, uh, yeah. and, but it's cool stuff. But anyways, the story in here, um, I, I just did it. I reduced Lee Brackett to Empire Strikes Back, and I didn't mean to do that. Um, <laughs> As a fan of her work, um, right. but uh, this story, All Colors of the Rainbow, is is an amazing um, anti-racism story, um, but it's it's really on the nose, but in a, a really excellent way. Um, it, it, and it pulls no punches, right? I mean, it's interesting, because for the most part, like, you see a lot of white people in science fiction in the 50s do start exploring civil rights issues in their science fiction, but it's usually so coded and it's so much like, oh, this isn't really about Earth. This is about the blue people of the planet, like Tor, you know, oppressing the yellow turtle people. Mm -hmm. And it's always so, uh, made so much of a metaphor that you almost lose track of what's happening. And it was pretty rare for anyone to directly tackle racism. And this story, it goes pretty head on, right? Like at one point, the, the rednecks start calling the aliens green niggers, essentially. I think they actually literally call them green niggers. So, you know, it makes it very clear that the racism of America is really what we're talking about there. And the ending of that story, wow, you know? It's definitely um, more forceful on the points than, than even the Twilight Zone would do at the time. Oh, absolutely. Right. I feel like in some ways it's, it was a really prescient ending, right? That if you push people of color too far, they're going to push back, right? Mm -hmm. And it's only 10 years between that story and the riot riots in like Watts and Detroit and stuff. So, um, you know, I don't want to say science fiction authors are never prophetic. They extrapolate from what's going on, but she certainly saw the score. No <laughs> doubt. So Joanna Russ's story, the barbarian is, I love that story is very much almost a tribute to the CL Moore stories, yeah. right? Yeah. That's yeah. earlier in the book. And, and, yeah. um, but she's Joanna Russ. I do want to talk about her story in here, but also I just want to talk about her impact because um, she's incredibly important to um, to the genre as a whole. Um, at, at in in general, not just as yeah. a, as a woman, but so right. yeah, Joanna Russ. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, she's amazing. Joanna Russ is one of my my favorite authors, and again, beyond even gender, she's just so funny and so angry and so inventive and always so on the nose with everything. Um, it's really just amazing, and I'm I'm so pleased that we could include her. And I I'm glad we did the Barbarian. There were some other choices, but I did want to show how there has been this tradition of sheroes in science fiction since the beginning, and how women have been in dialogue with each other and, and playing with these ideas. And what I love, I love the difference between the C.L. Moore and the Joanna Russ story, that Jarell of Jory is so much like a Hollywood heroine. C.L. Moore said she always wrote her characters to look like what she wished she looked like, right? So Jarell is like, she's so hot, and she's like redheaded and young and beautiful and perfect and all of that. And I love then that when you get to Joanna Russ, that Alex, she's middle-aged, she's a little dumpy, you know, and she doesn't care, right? She's so free, right? Mm -hmm. And I love this story, like, 
So I'd like to see how the heroines change over time. But they're both very savvy, right? Even though they're kind of fantasy heroines, they have a science fictional mindset. They're smart. They think rationally. They can think circles around other people in their world. And it was sort of, it was exciting to get to show that. I'm actually teaching the barbarian right now, and my students are like, oh, this is really cool. Look at how much smarter this thief is than the magician. So, yeah, yeah. it's been fun. It's well, fun. It really, even now, it still speaks to kids, and I think that's amazing. Well, and in and, and that sense, I recently, a couple of years ago, I read, I can't remember which novel was, uh, Cameron Hurley um, had a novel that I felt like this this story and, and the fact was it that... The was it the Stars Are Legion? I think it was, because um, I definitely read that. Was, it's all women, and the women give birth to either babies or machines, depending what on the, the ships need. Yeah. Is it that story? Yeah, that's yeah, a great book. Yeah, yeah, but the, cool. I, it might not have been that one. I've read two Cameron Hurley, Hurley okay. books, but I know that there was one where, when I was reading The Barbarian, the hero reminded mm -hmm. me of the hero in her book, um, and and, and uh, so it was just a yeah. immediate thing where I saw the... the, the um, Kind of the, the 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 future meeting the past kind of thing. Um, yes. yes. So and Ella so. Sheldon, who wrote under the name James Tripchy Jr., was uh, obviously one of the the biggest uh, names of women in science fiction, but with a man's name, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk about uh, Ella Sheldon's sure. impact and the story? Oh yep. So, right, so Alice Sheldon, she's one of those, um, she's one of the, the off figures, right, the ones who did go under male pseudonyms, um, who leads us to believe that this is why all the women use male pseudonyms. But, you know, both C.L. Moore and Tiptree, first of all, I just want to say, they had good reasons for taking on male pseudonyms. Um, and, you know, C.L. Moore took on her pseudonym because otherwise she was going to lose her job during the Great Depression, right? If, if people found out you had a second job, that would become grounds for firing you from your main job, especially if you were a woman. Because the theory was that it was important to the dignity of the American male to make sure that men were employed in the Depression. So, so Moore really had to protect that job she had at the bank, and that's why she used her pseudonym. Mm -hmm. And then Tiptree also, again, you know, she used her pseudonym in part because she had been a CIA agent. She was used to thinking in spooky ways and, and, and not wanting to reveal her real identity. But um, Tiptree, what a marvelous figure in, in history in general, as well as science fiction, right? Someone who had been big game hunting in Africa by the time she was four, someone who then grew up and was a painter. She then went to work in World War II um, for the predecessor to the uh, FBI. She had done uh, aerial surveillance work for the government. She became one of our first CIA agents in the 1950s. And then she left the CIA and went and got a PhD in psychology and then decided she wanted to be a science fiction writer. I mean, this woman had just done so much and she brought all those different experiences with her to science fiction. And it really allowed her to write in a kind of voice that no one had heard before. And her writing is just so fresh and sexy and bright, and it really excited people, right? Especially mm -hmm. when people thought she was James Tiptree. It's interesting that the minute she revealed who she was, people didn't seem to like her writing as much, even though I think many of the stories she wrote later are, are every bit as good as mm -hmm. the Tiptree stories. Did she continue to write under the name Tiptree after? She did. Known? She yeah. did. She wrote under three different names. So because she felt like she had three different kinds of writing, she did. So mm -hmm. she continued to do the Tiptree type stories under Tiptree, under that name. She would write feminist science fiction under the name Rakuna Sheldon. And then she would occasionally write under Alice Sheldon, although I think she did that far less than either the Rakuna Sheldon or the James Tiptree persona. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, the, the biography, the James Chiptree uh, biography is on my oh, list of things right, to read. Yeah. Um, and I definitely, I've read Tiptree before, but mm -hmm. um, like a lot of science fiction, I read, I read a lot of classic science fiction in the 90s, yeah. and I ha I'm ha finding myself having to reread a lot of it. Um, of for, for example, uh, The Female Man is, is one that mm -hmm. is on my list for this year because I read it, but I don't remember it very well. And I know with the, with everything that I've learned, I think I'd read it with yeah. very different eyes now. And um, before, 
we get into the last story, I just I, I wanted to share with you an experience because similar to yeah. when you were trying to find authors of color for for this book, um, I recently accidentally started with this podcast a series where I realized we had done three of the Hugo Award winners from the 60s. So, mm -hmm. so then I was like, well, why don't we just do episodes and all the Hugo winners from the 60s? And then <laughs> realized they're all white men <laughs> yeah. who wrote yeah. these books. And then, uh, but I'm committed, so I'm going to finish the That's 60s. Okay. They're, they're, they're great writers, and many of them are feminist friendly, and it'll open up other conversations. That's great. It's <laughs> right. Okay. Right. It, it, and, it's okay. Some of my best friends are white men. It's all cool. I'm actually <laughs> married to one, and I own one as a child. It's all good. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it's just funny because um, just looking at the list of the names and seeing, like, you know, and especially, like, because when I was researching which all the titles were, I'd see all the nominations, and I, you know, wasn't seeing some of the names that, that are in this book, you know, at the time. And I know right. Le Guin got some early nominations and she did. So did Russ. Yeah. So did Russ. Yeah. And so, um, so I know it happened, but right. um, it, it's just too bad that, um, but it, it, it took, took a while, but um, anyways, I'm still working on that series. We've only recorded three of the episodes so far and I'm currently reading Fritz Lieber to, uh, for oh, cool. 1964. But, Anyways, getting back to the future is female. The last story is obviously the one that was published in Playboy um, Nine Lives mm -hmm. um, by Ursula Le Guin. But uh, Le Guin is a hugely important author to me. Um, she's, I, I would say, probably my favorite uh, woman writing science fiction. Uh, the Dispossessed, Always Coming Home, uh, Left Hand of Darkness are all mm -hmm. crucially important to me. I'm not really into the Earthsea fantasy stuff. I'm just not a fantasy reader, to, to be honest right. with you. That's why a lot of the C.L. Moore stuff just doesn't do it for me. That but, makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. But with Le Guin, I, I, I find that um, there has been a lot said about her importance to the genre because she is so respected, but I still feel it's not enough. <laughs> I don't know if you feel that way, but I feel like no matter how much we say how – crucially powerful her work is it is just so great and i just don't know sure. if we do enough yeah well and you know in addition to just being a killer science fiction writer she's definitely been one of our best ambassadors right mm -hmm. she came up in a moment with a lot of really powerful writers um so at the time when Le Guin was making her name right kurt vonnegut was writing science fiction and thomas pynchon was writing science fiction and margaret atwood was beginning to dabble in it too but these are all authors who just, they ran from the genre. The minute they started winning genre awards, their publishers said, you can't do this. You cannot let yourself get stuck in the golden ghetto there, or you'll never get a real readership, right? And so you have people like Pynchon who, like, just didn't accept his, his I think it was either his Nebula or his Hugo. Kurt Vonnegut didn't do it. Like, you know, Atwood has always claimed she doesn't write science fiction. And this is what I love about Ursula Le Guin. She's so proud of being part of the genre, and she's, never had a problem defending it to the death and she her writing and her ability to talk about the genre she does it with such intelligence and grace and wit mm -hmm. that she's she she wins people over for us and she's she's again she's our best ambassador i think in many ways yeah and her letter, that was so it marvelous a, wasn't it a letter kind to of bridge wasn't it a letter to Margaret Atwood about like, hey, admit you're a science fiction writer? Uh, it was great. Oh, probably, probably, yeah. yeah. Probably. It was yeah. might have been an now, editorial or something, but yeah. it was great. And yes, and, you're right. She is a great ambassador for the. And she's never been afraid to be a science fiction writer. In fact, when we were putting the future as female together, I I was really fortunate that um, was it in that book? Yes, it was in that book where we, I, I, I was fortunate, I worked with Le Guin on the previous, on my previous book as well. She had blurbed the book and actually did a little proofreading for us, which was pretty exciting. Uh, and then with The Future is Female, we, we worked with her um, when we were right before her death and, and the story selection. And she was so great. She really was like, I don't know if Nine Lives is the best story. And she kept pulling out, like she was so thoughtful. And she pulled together a whole series of stories and explained why she thought each of them might be a really good contender. And just that kind of generosity with her time and her intellect, it was amazing. And I wish more people could have experienced that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know somebody's working on a documentary about her life. Um, right. And I, yeah, I'm really excited for that because, you know, we have the one about Harlan Ellison and, yes. and we have lots on PKD. And I think, yeah. you know, even if these things just end up on YouTube, I think that, that it's really important yeah. that um, we have these documents uh, to uh, before the history of all this, which... Yeah is the whole thing. And, and, um, you know, one of the reasons we're, we're doing this podcast is because we believe in the history of science fiction and we believe, um, you know, I, I, you know, part of the motivation for Anthony and I to do this podcast was that we felt like it, this would make us better writers. If, right. if we spent, if we went through PKD's entire catalog, but at the same time, right. it's like extending out into these other things. Um, you know, I'd say the interview we did with uh, Brian Evanson, um, who, you know, he's one of my favorite writers. And and then, you know, to pick his brain in that format, uh, you know, I just came out of it learning so much. And right. and, and I appreciate this conversation, too, because, um, you know, I can tell Lisa that, like, uh, I, you know, I'm super jealous of how well you know your shit. Um, <laughs> uh, with the so genre, they made the big bucks for right, <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, it makes me so happy that there's somebody who has made a career out of this. And so, um, to wrap things up, let's. Uh, um, what we have a lot of listeners who are purely um, dickheads, right? Sure. Um, in fact, I know, for example, our boy uh, Evan Lampy, who's going through the whole American Library thing, he started to read more science fiction as the start. But when he started his Phil K. Dick book club, he hadn't read any other science fiction but mm-hmm. uh, Phil K. Dick, I believe. Right. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people that they that that's really their introduction to this. Um, yeah. And and I think um, for the dickheads, like how how do you think you know, what is the the elevator pitch that you have for them for like why they should be checking out Sisters of Tomorrow, The Future's Female, Ooh, and, fi- and and finding right. these women's voices? Yeah. Well, I think that okay, I've got this for you. So I think a lot of what people enjoy about Philip K. Dick is that he gives voice to our suspicion, if not our deep down firm belief, that reality is a lot more complex than it first appears, and that there are other stories out there that can explain the world and the way things are and that we need to find those stories. And, you know, it it can be a crazy trip, right? Like you go through all sorts of levels of reality and all kinds of self-discovery for better or worse in these situations. But that sense that there's more out there than what we know and that maybe things are not organized always in our best interests if that's what interests you and turns you on about Dick, then I think it absolutely makes sense to read the women who are publishing at the same time because they're interested in those same issues about how the stories we tell about the world do not account for all levels of reality and not for all the ways we experience the world. And that sense that things are not always organized in our own best interests. Women often, believe it or not, have that feeling about culture. And (laughs) probably, I know, it's even still today, definitely so at mid-century where women were being invited to live pretty limited lives compared to what they had at other points in time. So maybe I think what's interesting is Philip K. Dick, can take you to the point where you can say, yeah, the world is not what I think it is and something else is going on. But he can't really take you any farther. He gets you to that realization, but he doesn't exactly have the solutions. And I think that often the women did have solutions because they had to somehow survive these crazy shifting realities and find ways to connect with other people and live and love and create and So if you want to find out what comes next after Philip K. Dick introduces you to the problems of modern reality and you want to start finding solutions, that it's good to go to look at the women who are writing at the same time. Yeah, and and a huge part of our mission is is like I said earlier, is the Dick adjacent. uh, Yeah. um, That's why, you know, John John Bruner is Mm -hmm. huge, Norman Spinrad, Ursula Le Guin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Octavia Butler, these are voices that, w- yes. you know, we want to turn people on to because yeah. they're, uh, uh, Samuel Delaney, uh, you know, yeah. and, and that's, uh, you know, 
it's 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 interesting, um, you know, just uh, to see uh, uh, also people that are our listeners like reaching out to those new voices and thanking us for that. So, and I really hope that people check out the future as female. So, Lisa, I really appreciate your time tonight. Um, I know we are on different time zones, so. Uh, it's much later for you, and I really appreciate how awesome and sharp you were with us. So thank you for joining us on Dickheads tonight. Oh, my goodness. Thank you guys so much. It's been my pleasure. So uh, anytime you need to talk about all things geek, especially if it's associated with women of geekdom, I'm your woman for that. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely have you back. I really appreciate your time. All right. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Mm-hmm.